Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments, where tonight we're going to take a look at Magic Squares. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI Technology to make those tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. And tonight we're really lucky to be joined by our two panelists, Ken Collins and Ron Lancaster. Ken has a BS in physics and an MS in math from BPI NYU and a PhD from Purdue University. He has taught for 56 years in middle school through graduate school. His focus is on effective use of technology and applying mathematics to analyze current issues. Ken gives five to 10 workshops each year at regional and national conferences such as NCTM, ACA, and T-Cubed. He is currently writing curriculum material for classroom explorations in mathematics and using mathematics to analyze critical problems in our society. Ken, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. And Ron is an associate professor emeritus at the University of Toronto where he taught mathematics courses for pre-service, middle, and high school teachers for 17 years. Before joining the faculty of the University of Toronto, Ron taught middle and high school mathematics for 23 years in co-ed public schools and a K-12 all-girls school. Ron's professional activities include consultations and conference presentations in North America, Asia, England, the Middle East, Africa, India, and Europe. Ron is an author for the NCTM, The Mathematical Lens, and a member of the advisory board for the Museum of Mathematics in New York City. He's the recipient of the 2015 Margaret Sinclair Memorial Award, Recognizing Innovation and Excellence in Mathematics Education, awarded by the Fields Institute. With that, Ron, it's great to have you with us. Thanks a lot, Mike. Happy to be here. And Ron, would you mind discussing what our agenda is going to look like tonight? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. Um, so, you know, tonight we're going to be taking a look at magic squares, even if you've never heard about them. You know, we'll start from scratch. And um, so we're going to look, we're going to explore that, some of the mathematics behind magic squares. And we're also going to look at the role of technology. You know, how can you use TI Inspire and the TI 84? Uh, we'll do some looking at coding. And at the end, stick around because Mike is going to do a draw as well. So, welcome to all of you. Thanks so much, Ron. And Ken is going to discuss our expected outcomes for tonight. So, uh, what, here are some of the things that uh, we'll be working with, and hopefully, uh, you'll be able to um, do these on your own. Uh, creating your own magic uh, three by three square, um, being able to take a three by three square and raise it to an odd power and see what type of patterns you have there. Uh, show that when you do that, uh, say with a cube, you get another magic square, and we can see if that continues with other odd powers. Um, you develop. Hey, Ron, I think we might have just lost Ken's audio. Okay, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, it's going to be only an hour. We're going to, you know, touch on all of these things here, but you'll at least get a sense for how to make a magic square, how to, you know, take that magic square and make additional ones. We'll look at some mathematical formulas related to magic squares. And a big piece is we're going to take a look at thinking of a magic square as a matrix. You know, what can you do with that? Uh, so those would be some of the fundamental things that we're going to do. Awesome. Uh, so, Ron, I just gave you control. Feel free to share your screen and we'll uh, try and get Ken back online here real soon. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so, okay. And, uh, Mike, um, you can see the screen? Yep, it looks good. It looks like we have Ken back to you. Great, fantastic. Okay. Um, you know, as I said a minute ago, this is only going to be an hour long. 
Um, we're not going to do a deep dive into a lot of these things, but both of our email addresses are going to be available to you. We have a Dropbox folder set up with some files in it. So, and Ken and I are, you know, very happy to hear from you afterwards. Uh, we, you know, where you can maybe raise some questions with us, or if you're going to go use it with your students, we can, you know, um, you know, talk to you about that. So, um, so what is a magic square? If you've never seen these before, it's really very simple. It's just a square array of numbers. So, uh, you know, the, the one you're looking at here uses the numbers from one to sixteen. It's a four by four magic square. It's called a normal square because it uses the numbers from one to sixteen. There are magic squares where you just use, you know, whatever numbers, you know, they don't have to be consecutive numbers like this, but that's an example. And if you take the numbers, the four numbers in any row, in any column, or the two main diagonals, and if you add up those four numbers, you will always get 34. And that's a magic square. These things don't have to be squares. There are magic rectangles, there are magic circles and cubes and stars, and it just, this goes on and on and on, as you'll soon discover if you haven't looked at magic squares. But that's an example of one. There are 880 four by four magic squares. This is one of them. But this one is just so special. So what I'd like you to do for a moment in the chat is go to the chat and just see if you can find some other combinations of four numbers that add up to 34. So this one has the four rows, the four columns, and the two main diagonals. But can you find some other combinations that add up to 34? And in the chat, you can just identify them with letters. Um, so uh, we'll just see what happens in the chat. Ken, can you keep an eye in the chat? Okay. And, uh, and let me know if you see some combinations that come up here. So this square is unusual. Um, you, if you look at other uh, magic squares, they're not going to have this bonus, you know, of extra combinations. And do you see any? Okay. C H I N B E L O A D M P F G J K. Beautiful. You know, some of you might want to say it verbally, you know, in the way of saying the four corners. So the four corners add up to 34. The four central numbers add up to 34. Um, want to see how many there are? Look at that. This magic square is, it's like unbelievable. And my question to you and your students is, is this all of them? So are there other combinations? But this just has such beautiful symmetry, you know, in it. There are so many combinations of numbers that add up to 34. So this is unusual. Um, you know, not all magic squares uh, have this property. Um, and if you think you have them all, or if you think your students have them all, how do you know? Um, so anyway, I'll leave that to you to, to take a look at. So for your students, what you could do is ask them to make a three by three magic square uh, using the numbers from one to nine. So this is going to be a normal three by three magic square. Um, your students could obviously just kind of randomly throw numbers in, um, but what strategies, you know, might your students use, you know, to do this? If, if you've maybe done this before, what strategy did you use to find a three by three magic square? And again, Chad, uh, Ken, you can maybe just keep an eye on the chat. Okay. You know, just see if, if there's anything that comes in. A second question is if you have a bit of a maker space in your classroom where you have some stuff uh, in the room, what could you use uh, in your room? So, you know, what, what, should, what could you have in your maker space that students could use to do this? In other words, what are some manipulatives that could be sitting there that your students could get up and try and make a magic square, you know, instead of doing it on paper and pencil? So Ken, keep an eye in the chat there as well. And um, I just paper cut and Ken paper cutouts. Uh, beautiful, right? You could print out the numbers, you know, from one to nine on eight and a half by eleven paper, and you could have students, you know, get on the floor, and actually lay down the pieces of paper, you know, and do that. That's beautiful. 
Um, oh, I just saw one, Ken. Find the magic sum. Yeah. Yeah. That is gorgeous because that's a fundamental issue. Your students will come to you and say, you know, like, I, what what's the sum supposed to be? You know, you just showed me a four by four magic square where the sum was 34, but what what am I trying to get? You know, and they're precisely nailing what they need to find out. So that's beautiful. Um, anything else, Ken? So they were talking about adding the first uh, positive nine integers and looking at that sum and um, and then that has to be the rows and columns. The three of them, and wow. so if you divide by three, uh, 45 by three, you get 15. Wow, that is excellent. Um, you know, Somebody... if we were together in a classroom, mm -hmm. you know, what you could then ask your students is, okay, so, you know, you found the sum, you know what it's supposed to be, but how will that help you? You know, what will you do with that information? So, you know, that would be the next step uh, with your students. Um, I'm going to just stop my sharing my screen for a moment. And um, what I'd like to do here is just, uh, well, actually, you know, I can keep um, sharing here, but I'm going to share um, this here. So the idea of manipulatives um, on the table here, I have a few things that you could use. You could use playing cards, right? You could have the numbers from one to nine. You could have index cards. You could have, uh, you know, alphabet blocks. You know, the blocks that young kids play with. This could be in your maker space. Um, these are um, plastic pieces that are dominoes. It's a different kind of domino, but you could have that. So these are some of the manipulatives that you could have, um, you know, there. Um, while I've got uh, the table being shown here, these are some of the magic squares that, that books that Ken and I have. And um, we have a bibliography that we put together for you at the end of the PowerPoint, and you'll find all of these books listed. And I mean, there's a lot of information obviously available online, but some of these books are absolutely outstanding. So, um, so you could take a look at those. So, uh, back to the PowerPoint. Um, that was wonderful, Ken, what you described. So somebody was saying, add up the numbers from one to nine. What you're really doing is adding up the numbers in the three rows or the numbers in the three columns. Mm -hmm. So if you let S represent the magic sum, we know that 3s is 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to 9. And if you're teaching quadratics, there's a formula for that, Gauss's formula. 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n is n times 1 over 2, n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Uh, so this would be a nice place where you could tie this in into the curriculum uh, with this formula. So you know that the target is 15. So again, you know, with your students, you know, the next step is, okay, well, what do you do with this? And really, the fundamental thing is you've got to find combinations of three numbers that add up to 15. So in the chat, throw in some combinations. So there's one of them. 8 plus 3 plus 4 is 15. You're only using the digits 1 to 9, and you can't have any duplication. So in a magic square, you don't have duplicates in a normal magic square. The numbers are from 1 to 9, one number per cell. So um, so we've got 834. Are there any that uh, have come in, Ken? Well, a lot of people are suggesting now number three numbers that add up to the 15, 816, 564, 249. Beautiful. So they're going through different possibilities, That's 357. Awesome. And um, of course, as teachers, you know, we would say to our students, okay, so how do you know you've got them all? Mm -hmm. You know, are you done? Like, are there more? How do you know? And this is really essentially the same thing as rolling a pair of dice, right? You could, that's another place where you could tie this into the curriculum. You know, how many ways are there of taking two pairs of dice and rolling a seven? You know, it's A plus B is seven. It's the, it's the same math, you know, that we're doing here. So um, there's, there's a number of places where you can, you know, add this into um, your curriculum uh, as an example. So that is all the different ways. So there, are, that's the number of ways that you can make 15. Mm -hmm. And again, it, we keep coming back to this, but okay, so you've got them, but now what are you going to do? So how does this help you? You know, this list. Um, and any thoughts in the chat? You know, what, what do you think? So we got all the ways, but like, so what? 
Like, who cares? I mean, how does this help you make the magic square? I mean, we're back to just kind of throwing numbers in randomly, you know, here. So how does this help um, to get this? Any comments? Some people are making lists. Making a list? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, again, we only have an hour here, you know, to do this. You're going to spend more time in your classroom with this. The fundamental thing that your students need to think about is what's different about these cells. The center is involved in a number of sums, right? It's involved in this sum, this column, this row, and two main diagonals. So it's going to be in four sums. Can you find a number in the list that's involved in four sums? And if you take a look and see, I mean, you'll see that it's the number five. So you know that five is in the center. Again, what's the difference between the corners and the edges? You know, and, and like the corners are involved in three sums, you know, a row and a column and a diagonal. So again, look for what numbers go in the corner. So that'll be this, that's one strategy that students can use, you know, to complete the square. But you found it. Are there any others? And how do you know? Um, you know, if there are or not. Um, so right now, if you could take your finger and come up to the screen, this feels like a David Copperfield trick, the magician where he tells people to come up to the screen and touch the screen, and then something magical happens, you know, like he, he vanishes or something. You know. But <laughs> um, but anyway, just they touch, went yeah, touch the number one. So just put your finger right at one. And now move your finger to two. Now move it to three. Move it to four. Move it to five. Move it to six. Move it to seven. Move it to eight. Move it to nine. So think about that motion and what patterns do you see? Your students could do this on the floor. So they could stand in the floor. Stand in the number one. Move to the number two. Move to the number three, move to the number four, five, six, and so on. You know, what pattern is there in that walk? And once you see that pattern, can you make a five by five magic square? Um, again, in an hour presentation, you know, we, we could spend another 10 minutes flushing this out and having you describe what patterns you use. Um, but look, here's the pattern. So for a five by five magic square, Okay, right now, Ron, the screen is sort of blank. Is that what you wanted? Uh, the which? Uh, what we're viewing on the screen is blank. Hmm. Yeah, it should be. Um, that screen didn't do anything else. Is it okay now? Nope. No. I thought this was like part of the magic square yep. trick. No. <laughs> uh, can you Ron, the magician. Ron, do you want to maybe just stop sharing for a second and then try and read? You know what? Uh, it says you're sharing quick time. Uh, uh, there we go. So, um, yep. So, um, you know, uh, just um, stop sharing. There we go. Okay, good. So yep. you got expected outcomes on the screen now. Good. Okay. Yep. So we'll come back here and get that PowerPoint up. Good. So, okay, okay now. Looks good. Yes. Great. Yep. Good. So, you know, trying to take the three by three square and generalize it to the five by five, you know, there's a one in the middle of the top row, put a one in the middle, you know, the top row, and then just mimic the way you move. You know, take the one, move way down to the column beside it, move up in the diagonal, move up in the diagonal, I mean, if you look at from three to four, you know, the three is down here. And if you think of going outside the square, you're over here and then up in the diagonal. Essentially, you're going one over one up, one over one up, one over one up. And then eventually you get blocked and you go straight down. So you come down. So it's really just mimicking the same moves and you can create, um, you know, a five by five magic square by just following the same pattern. You may need to look at this for a little while. 
I, again, I keep saying this, but in a one hour presentation, it, you know, we, we're not probably spending enough time in this, but if you come back to this and look at the pattern and how you move, it's the same pattern in the five by five. So you could now make a seven by seven, a nine by nine, 11 by 11. This will work for all odd squares, uh, this method. Um, there's only one three by three magic square, but there are millions of five by five magic squares. Um, you know, so this is just one method for producing one magic square. Uh, and the magic constant is 65 for um, a five by five square. Um, and, you know, this is a coding opportunity for your students. Um, you know, develop some coding for the TID4 basic or Python, T and Tanspire, whatever calculator. Can you develop some coding so that the calculator makes the, the you know, the magic square? Because this is very methodical the way this is done. You know, take the top row, put a one, move here, move there, move there. It's perfect for coding, you know, to do that. So it'll be a, a great program for your students to write. Um, you know, to do that. The even squares, we're not going to get into this much tonight because the even squares, the doubly even, like 4, 8, 12, etc., they're not too bad to make, but the singly even squares are a nightmare. They're very difficult. Um, so you want to just focus on the odd squares uh, with your students uh, to do that. And by the way, that formula uh, that you saw earlier, uh, the n times n squared plus one over two. Another way of developing that is you could show your students some magic squares with these magic sums. They could calculate them and ask them to find a model for this data. You don't have much data, but you could, you know, do the first differences, not linear, do the second differences, not linear. Well, maybe it's cubic. And, you know, on the TID4, for example, you could do a cubic regression. And it turns out you do get the formula. Um, so that's another way of getting the formula for uh, the magic constant. Uh, or you could do it the same way as before and come up with n times n squared plus one over two, um, you know, for that. So, um, and you know, if you think of a magic square as being a matrix, there are some really powerful questions that you can ask. That's what Ken is going to do at this stage, because this is just stunning stuff with with matrices that is really beautiful. So, Ken, we are going to make uh, you the presenter. And um, you are set to go. OK. Well, good evening, everybody. And I see some familiar names on, uh, on the chat screen, so it's hi to everyone out there. Okay, so um, so I'm presenting my screen now. And um, okay, so yeah, Ron, we're not seeing it just yet. Okay. And Ken, uh, when you're done, I'll get to those extensions about uh, e and square roots and things like that. Okay. Still don't see your uh, screen, Ken. Okay, so um, right down at the bottom, I have my share. Okay, and I'll do that again. Good. There we go. You you can see it. Yep. Yep. You bet. All right. It must have clicked on the wrong button the first time. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and talk about uh, some of these three by three magic squares. So here's um, one that is. Uh, the magic square using one through nine, three by three. So the magic sum is 15. So you can go ahead and um, load that um, into uh, a calculator as a three by three matrix, and then go ahead and cube it. Okay. And if your students are uh, already proficient in matrix arithmetic, then um, you know you can go ahead and let the calculator do it for them. Or if they're learning it as part of the process, that you know they they can do that, and this way they're they're raising it and multiplying you know for a purpose rather than just you know doing one matrix product after another with no real point to it. 
So what's interesting is that when you cube this matrix A that has a magic sum of 15, you get this matrix here, which has a magic sum of 3,375, which is 15 cubed. So maybe that's just a coincidence. Um, you know, it. what happens instead if we take that matrix and raise it, say, to the fifth power? So if we do that, uh, we get this really chunky matrix here, okay? And the, the, um, the magic sum here is 759,375, okay? You don't have to do that in your head. And uh, that turns out to, be, well, you all know that's 15 cubed, right? You all know the powers of 15 and so forth. Um, so that's 15 to the fifth when we took A to the fifth. And if we took A to the seventh, we'd have a huge magic sum over 170 million, which turns out to be exactly 15 to the seventh. So, of course, this doesn't prove anything, but it's a very strong indicator that, in fact, we have these patterns that when you raise the magic square to a power, the magic sum also gets raised to the same power. Now, if you want to generalize this, um, there are a number of different ways of representing a magic square with variables. So here's one way to do it, and I'll show another way. And you could check it out by taking a look at the sums of any rows or columns or the diagonals and see that the magic sum is 3u. Okay. So now what happens if we take this and cube it? And unfortunately, I can't fit on a single screen what the cube of that matrix would look like. So what I did was called it matrix E and went ahead and described the nine elements of the um, list. So there are the first six. And so, you know, this is row one right here. And if you multiply things out and add it, you'll see that all of these things here cancel and you're just left with 27U cubed, which of course is the cube of that magic sum that we started with, 3U, okay? And that continues, you know, with the last row here, and you can confirm that um, for yourselves. And I am not going to do the fifth or the seventh power with these variable matrices. Sorry about that. Um, but you know, for students who you know want to see more proof, so to speak, of why this is actually happening, this is certainly one way to do it. And so, um, what happens? Um, if instead of the odd number being positive, the odd number is negative. So what happens if we take A to the negative one and we interpret that as A inverse? Okay, well, we have to go ahead and find the determinant of that three by three matrix A. It turns out to be 360. And again, you can use a calculator for that, or you can use it as part of an exercise, students learning how to do determinants and inverses. And then the adjoint of uh, matrix A will look like this. And so we can express the inverse as one over the determinant times the adjoint of matrix A. Now, if you take a look at this adjoint, amazingly enough, this is a magic square also, even though there are these negative numbers here, if you add up any row or any column or the diagonals, you get 24. But of course, the inverse is every one of these numbers divided by 360. So that if we were to take uh, the magic sum of any row or column or diagonal, it would be 24 divided by 360, which reduces to 1 over 15, which is the reciprocal of the magic number of the original matrix A. So even if we interpret the uh, negative one odd number as we would normally for a matrix as an inverse, it gives, it follows the pattern that we've developed uh, for raising a um, three by three uh, matrix representing a magic square to any odd power. And it's really amazing that it works 
with a negative odd number and then interpreting that the way we normally do as a um, as the Ken, inverse of the matrix. Come on. Ken, there's a comment in the chat from Justine who says math is awesome. And you know, for all of us, if you never use this with your students, you have to stand back and just feel, you know, some awe. Like of, oh my God, I mean, like this is unbelievable. You know, that that cubes and inverses and all this are still magic squares. It's like, come on, how could this be? You know, it's such a stunning result. Yeah. So that was nice. Justine says math is awesome. It is. Even at my age, it's still awesome. Okay. All right. So um so here's uh there are a couple of a number of ways that you can take a magic square and create another magic square from it. So um, here's another three by three magic square and the magic sum is 15 again. All right, so let's suppose we, we wanna create another magic square from this. So take a look at the first row, first column eight. Well, we're gonna replace eight with the sum of the numbers that you get. If you cross out the row and column that eight belongs to, that leaves you with the five, seven, nine, two. And then you add them up, okay, and then take 8 and replace it with that sum of 23. And then you continue doing that with every single element. So for the 1, you cross out the first row and the second column. So we get a 3, 4, and a 7, and a 2, okay? So that gives us 16. And so we take that 1 and replace it with a 16. And you do that for every one of those elements. And we get this new magic square. And the magic square um, has a magic sum of 60. All right, and remember the original one had a magic sum of 15. So, um, you know, is that just random or is there something going on here that's a definite pattern? So let's go back and take a look at the sort of variable magic square. Okay, the sum here, if you check it out, is going to be 3u. And now we're going to do the same thing that we did with the numerical matrix. Say for the first row, first column, we'll cross out the first row, cross out the first column, and then we add up these four elements. So we get the four u's. We get the V and negative V cancel out, W negative W cancel out. We have an extra negative V. So it looks like we'll have four U minus V. And that's exactly what we have here. Okay, and you can go through the same process with all the others. And so this is what you get here. All right, now what's gonna be, uh, this is a magic square. And the magic sum, you can see easily from this diagonal that it's going to be 12u, okay, which is, of course, exactly four times what 3u is. So that magic sum that we got of 60, that was not just some random happening. That was four times the original magic sum of 15, okay? Okay, so, um, so if we were to continue... With the numerical example, okay, if we take this matrix B, cross out the first row and the first column, add up these together, okay, so that's going to give us um, something like 83, and we put that in here, and then we continue this process with all of the other numbers using the same procedure. This is what we get. If you add up the magic, it's a magic square. If you add up, check the magic sum, you get 240. And of course, this one back on um, B was 60. So once again, it's exactly four times what we started with. And again, if you, if, <clears throat> if you have the fortitude, you can go ahead and take this matrix D and do the same thing uh, to see what you would get um, and you would see that you would get uh, 48U for the magic sum. So, um, so this is a way of showing it numerically and also showing it algebraically. And, um, you know, especially students, you know, who have uh, interested in 
being able to show that it's true for all of them because you can't do it by exhaustion. Um, you know, this, this is a pretty dramatic way of showing it. So, you know, Ken, I might add, um, yes. you know, I mentioned that there was only one three by three magic square. Right. That's using the numbers from one to nine. What Ken is showing you is how you don't have to use one, two, three, four, five, six. You could use any arithmetic series, you know, and that's essentially what's going on here, you know, with this. So that's why there's so many different magic squares. It's no longer a normal one using the numbers from one to nine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ron, did you want to continue? Um, yeah, absolutely. So if you pass it back to me, Ken. Okay. Um, oops. All right, so stop sharing. Um, okay, so. Um, can it should be under a sign or there was that other method that Mike showed you okay. under participants. So, um, okay. I see at the top, I have, um, you know, the share view. There should be a sign where you can assign me. As the presenter. Okay. Um, I just switched. Should have control. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Yep. So, um, that um, we have a couple bonuses. This is actually really complicated. We're just going to leave this with you. But what Ken has done is he's looked at, you know, a cubed, a to the fifth. What about a squared? What about a to the fourth? You know, pow even powers. So what about those? Here's a couple extras. What about taking E to the power of a matrix? I know this may seem crazy to you, but you can use the Taylor series. I plus A plus A squared over two factorial, et cetera. Is that a magic square? What about the square root of the matrix? How in the world do you do that? It's not the square root of the elements. So those are some extras for you know, your students who are, you know, maybe more curious about mathematics can handle more of a challenge, you know, who are willing to do a bit of research online, you know, to find out how do you do, how do you find the square root of the matrix? So we'll leave that with you. Um, you know, magicians have used magic squares for years. Many stage magicians uh, have routines in their acts that use a magic square. And they also use a knight's tour. So a knight's tour is where you put a, a knight on a chessboard, on an eight by eight chessboard. It could be any board, but this is an eight by eight chessboard. So you put the knight down, I'm standing in a square right now, and then you make a knight's move. So you go maybe two spaces forward, one space to the left, and you put down a two. And then you move again, do another knight's move, and put down a three. And you're trying to do the whole square. This is a closed knight's tour. So when you're finished, look at the 64 in red. You can get from the 64 back to the one. And there have been magicians for decades that have used magic squares like this in a stage show, you know, where they, they create a, a night's tour in front of the audience. Um, what mathematicians have tried to do is to see if they can find a night's tour that's also a magic square. So can you find it? This one is close. This night's tour, the rows all add up to the same number, the columns all add up to the same number, but not the diagonals. So it's a semi magic square. Uh, well, so there has been a big burning question for 150 years. The mathematicians have tried to find a night's tour that's also a magic square. And it got settled in 2003 and an international team working on computers all over the world, we're able to determine that the answer is no. So it is impossible to find a knight's tour that is also a fully magic square. These knight's tours are actually really cool. And, um, you know, you can have students try to find one and, you know, on paper and pencil, and, you know, they put one somewhere in the square and then move and put a two and move and put a three and put a four. 
But you'll find when you get up to about 40, you get stuck. But you have nowhere to go, you know, because the places you can go to are filled. So you have to back up, you know, and do that. This is another coding opportunity for your students. So can your students write a program in TI Basic or TI Python so that this time the calculator doesn't do, you know, like the earlier one, like where the calculator was doing the magic square. This one is where you're doing the night's tour and you're using the calculator as a way of entering in your data. In the Dropbox folder, you're gonna have um, this program. Um, this program right here, when you use this, it asks you um, what size magic square you'd like. And there's the uh, eight by eight square. And when you press the enter key and scroll over, um, you can enter in your numbers and um, you can put them in. So it's a way of recording it. And if you get tired, you can actually press the second key and you can stop the tour. And um, and you wanna save it? Sure, so we'll save it. And then when you launch the program again, it'll ask you, you know, do you wanna keep going? So yes, keep going, number two. And it, re it loads it back in and then you can continue on. Um, this is a program that I created many, many years ago, originally for the TI-83. It has another feature, if you press the clear key, it erases your last step and you can go back. And if you press clear again, it goes back. And this way you can, you know, try something else if you get stuck. Um, but what would be a neat exercise for your students is to give them the code. So, you know, one way of learning how to code is to look at somebody else's code. You can give them the program, have them run it. They can put pause commands into the program and have it stop in places and try and understand, you know, what, what is this program doing and how does it work? So I'm not gonna go through all the code with you tonight, but that would be a lovely exercise for your students. Um, we'll leave you with, uh, with that. Um, I did wanna just share with you some magic squares that may just take your breath away. Um, these are some that are just stunning. So take a look at this nine by nine magic square. This is not normal. It's not using the numbers from one to nine squared. But this is crazy. This is actually an additive square and a multiplicative square. If you multiply the numbers together in any row, any column in the two diagonals, you get the same number. So in the chat, how could your students take the square and try to unravel the mystery as to how this was made? What could you do? So Ken, keep an eye in the comments in the chat. Will do. So you give your students the square, you know, they see the property. How can you take the mystery away? How in the world was this made? And this was made in 1962. Like there were no, you know, big heavy powered computers that could do this. Are there any thoughts, Ken, in the chat? Um, not, I don't see any yet. Okay. Well, again, because we only have an hour here. Well, look at the factors. Done. Absolutely. Look at the factors. Look at the first row. There's a 17. I guarantee you in the second row, there's a number in there that is a multiple of 17. You know, they all have multiples of 17 in every row and in every column and in the main diagonals. So absolutely. But do you want to factor all those numbers? Maybe not. So that's another coding opportunity. Could you write a program so that it'll, you could input the numbers and it'll factor them for you? Um, you know, and then you could try to unravel the mystery as to how in the world this thing was made. So um, this is another magic square that is very curious. Um, if you take that four by four magic square and turn it upside down, it's still a magic square. If you hold it in a mirror, it's still a magic square. So it's like an ambigram, like the word noon and zoonims, or the cover of Mad Magazine. Um, Ken, you were telling me something about this magazine. 
Uh, I was in high school when the magazine came out in 1961, and we I uh, grew up in uh, New York City, so we were avid fans of Mad Magazine. You remember that cover, don't you? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't keep my Mad Magazine, so that uh, be worth a lot case. of money, Ken. Yeah. yeah. Um, certainly, certainly, in an um, you know, it, it had yeah. a high nerd factor. So, um, yeah, I remember we were turning it upside down. Beautiful. No it's like Dan Brown's book. 1961. You know, one of Dan Brown's books, Angel and Demons, I think you can turn it upside down. Um, this one is just like, oh, my goodness. You know, Ken and I were both talking about this square, but this is like, oh, my goodness. This is a massive 10 by 10 magic square. And if you take the border away, it's another, it's now an 8 by 8 magic square. Take the border away, it's a 6 by 6 magic square, a 4 by 4 magic square. You may want to just put a copy of this on your wall in your classroom. Just have it on the wall. Have it on the ceiling. It's just something for students to look at and to marvel. And just to think, oh, and like, how would you make this? How would you make a bigger one? How would you make another one? You know, magic squares without borders or with borders. Um, stunning. Um, in the magic of Lee Sallows, oh my goodness, you've got to get this book uh, by Lee Sallows. So here's a magic square by Lee Sallows. So what? It's not a normal one. It doesn't use the numbers from one to nine. Write down in English those numbers. So for five, write down F-I-V-E. Okay. Big deal. What's the big deal? Count the number of letters in each word. So like five, there's four letters and you get another magic square. Like, how would you ever get this? How would you make one of these? But it goes from the numbers to the letters to the numbers and it's a magic square all, all along the way. You ready for a shock? This is Lee Sallows. This is a geometric magic square where the numbers all add up to the same thing, but so do the shapes. When you put the shapes together, you get the same shape. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's just like, whoa. Beautiful thing to have up on your wall or to have Lee Sallows book and tear out some of the pages and put them up on the wall. There were some stamps in China that were released to celebrate his work um, some years ago. Um, stunning um, that work. This is the Dropbox folder that Ken and I have set up. And Ken, I'll turn things back over to you because there are a few of the things you'd like to talk about, the Ben Franklin. Sure. Okay. So it's just um, B-I-T, you know, bit.ly. Uh, and then it's just magic of T-I. Um, so we can come back to this at the end. Um, I'll uh, turn things back over to Ken. And okay. uh, Ken's going to give you some um, um, really cool stuff about Ben Franklin. Yes. And it's all yours. Thank you. Can you see this? Uh, not yet, Ken. Okay. So I've got to present. You just, your share button down at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Got it, Ken. Yep. Great. Okay, so, um, so Ben Franklin uh, was a big enthusiast uh, of magic squares and and squares in general, and uh, this is one of the many squares he created. It's not a magic square. The rows and the columns uh, all add up to two hundred and sixty. But the diagonals uh, do not. So, however, this magic square has something called bent diagonals. So, what's a bent diagonal? So, it's a diagonal sort of bent in half. So, for example, you could start with any of the numbers on the left-hand column, say the 11. And you can go up diagonally, 11, 60, 62, 13 then go across one and then come down this way. 
okay? So that's called a bent diagonal. Um, even if you start near the top, you can still have a bent diagonal. You go 14, 61. Now you would want to go up one more. And so what you do is you pretend that these are connected and that would lead you to the 64, then 15, then 18, then go back down to 33, go back down again, circle back up, that'll leave you with 36, and then 19. So there are these eight bent diagonals here. And each of those bent diagonals also add up to um, 66, 260. Okay. All right. If you take a look at any two by two subsquare in here, any two by two subsquare, okay, it adds up to 130. And even if you bend around and pick up the other side, so 48, 33, uh, 20, 29, that'll add up to um, 130 also. Okay. And then if you take four squares that are equidistant from the center. So the center is right here. So here are four squares equidistant from the center and add them up and you get 230, 130. Or the five, seven, 57, 40, 28. Those are all equidistant from the center. Or the 13 and 20 and 49 and 48. They're all equidistant from the center. Or the four corner numbers. So any of those four that are symmetric and equidistant from the center, okay, that sum is going to add up um, to 130. And people asked Franklin, um, you know, how was he able to just create, because there's no technology here except for the technology between your ears, okay, which is very powerful. And um, and he said he could write out these matrices as as quickly as his writing would allow. Uh, I would have loved to have seen that, but um, even at my age, I wasn't a contemporary of Franklin. So um, in the in the uh, reference files, I put in a sixteen by sixteen matrix that Franklin developed that has all of these properties of the eight by eight and even some additional ones. And it, it's really an amazing um, matrix and um, something that, um, you know, you can put a large copy of it on a bulletin board or a cabinet in, in your classroom and just see what the students can come up with in terms of patterns. It's an amazing um, set of matrices that Franklin came up with. And Ken, I think that's a good point that you know we've we've raised a couple times now of you know of just putting things up on your wall from magic squares. You know, the joy of mathematics. It may not be practical, although Latin squares that are related to magic squares are very practical, uh, but it's just beautiful objects to have on the walls of your classroom. I mean, there may be some students who are like, I don't care, you know, it's like whatever, but there's gonna be students who look at these things and it'd be just like, wow. Um, this is a great book uh, that Ken and I both have about uh, Benjamin Franklin squares, and uh, it'll be in our bibliography, you know, as well. Highly recommended uh, the book. Ken, shall I put up the uh, uh, Dropbox uh, link again? Yes. So if you pass the control back to me, I'll uh, I'll put that up so people have a chance. Okay. And then in a moment, we'll turn things over to um, uh, to Mike. You know, we can also take some questions as well. So, um, if there are some questions that uh, you have, um, so there'll be a bibliography. There are some books that uh, we recommend. There are some websites and also some articles, some journal articles as well um, that uh, there will be in there. And all of those files you saw Ken using, there'll be uh, Word files and PDF files, and there'll also be um, the, the PowerPoint file that you see here as well. So that'll be in there. Ken and I really hope that there's something that you'll get from tonight. Uh, even if you don't use any of this stuff in your classroom ever in your, in your entire teaching career, at least maybe you've had a moment of just like, oh my goodness. I mean, this is just mind blowing, you know, these magic squares, but 
but it may also, you know, get you into magic squares and, you know, and using this with, you know, some of your students or all of your students. Ken, do you see any questions in the chat? Well, somebody made an interesting observation that perhaps Franklin's time as a typesetter might have been able to help him be able to see patterns and numbers. Um, and, and I think that's a, um, yeah, that's a good observation. So, so they're suggesting that he was that type of guy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Maybe not as good a punster as you are, Ron, but, um, but he certainly, um, he was, we know he was more than just a square guy, at least according to the women in Paris. Uh, any other comments, Ken, or questions? Oh, that's nice. There was uh, somebody mentioned the Anya Greer conference at Exeter, Ken. Yes. Uh, speaking of Exeter, it's going to be running this year. So uh, if you're able to attend a conference at the end of June at Phillips Exeter Academy, it's a week long conference that is amazing. And Ken and I have been presenting there for a long time, and there's so many great presenters uh, at that conference. So if you can, put it on your calendar. Um, any other questions, Ken? Um, well, I, so, I, th I think that what's nice about the magic squares is that you can approach it at so many different levels. I mean, you can have elementary school students working with it. Um, and then you can get very theoretical with it and, and it becomes you go to the moon. sophisticated. So, um, it, it's, it, it's, it's a, has a lot of entry points. And, and that's, that's, you know, great for anything that we're doing in math. And, you know, you can pass French with it. Uh, I know this sounds weird, but in, um, first year university, I took a first year French course and, uh, I knew the language part. I, I, you know, I knew I was going to ace that, but I not, I did not read any of the books, um, you know, in the course. And um, so what I did is I wrote my professor a great big long essay on how to make magic squares. You know, I wanted to at least demonstrate that I could write in French. I mean, I hadn't read these books and I ended up with 52 in the course. So the, the grammar part, I had perfect on it. And I guess for some reason they gave me two marks as a charitable mark. You know, for it. So, Mike, we'll throw it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. I know uh, Ken and Ron early on uh, mentioned that if you do have any questions, I know this is maybe a lot to digest tonight. Uh, feel free to reach out to them after the fact uh, via email. I know they'll both be. Uh, very receptive to uh, your thoughts and conversations. As mentioned earlier, we are giving away to one lucky winner tonight a TI graphing calculator. Uh, tonight's lucky winner is R. Ronan. So, congratulations. We'll be in touch over email uh, soon to give you a little more information about that. Uh, but we're excited uh, to give R. Ronan a TI graphing calculator tonight. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click the link in the chat window. Also, this is a link for the documents that were used by Ken and Ron tonight. And if you're missing this for any reason, uh, just hang tight. You'll automatically get a follow-up email in a couple of days. And that follow-up email will contain links to the certificate, the documents, and the recording. So you can go back and watch this at your own pace. If you're in need of any post-webinar follow-up, feel free to give us a call at 1-800-TI-CARES or drop us an email, ti-cares at ti.com. We'd love to hear from you. When you leave the webinar tonight, a brief survey will automatically appear in your browser. Your feedback guides us as we plan future online events, like planning for this Magic Squares webinar uh, that we've, uh, we put on the docket for this fall. So please feel free to share your thoughts in that post webinar survey. Big thanks to Ron and Ken uh, for all the time they, uh, they had putting everything together tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks a lot to everybody. Thanks Hopefully Mike. One day soon everybody to the conference came. in person. Absolutely. And thanks everyone for joining us. We hope to see you back online next week.
have a great night.